the German would periodically come around in the middle of the night for a smasher, hoping somebody would answer it, and then they, they knew where you were pretty good and bring the artillery in. And one afternoon, uh, we had a, a TD come in, a tank destroyer, and we hated to see a jeep or, or any kind of vehicle come, because you knew immediately the Germans were going to have some artillery. So he came in, and instead of going down toward the front, he turned on a little side road. And when the first shells came in, everybody got in the slit trench, except Dean Christensen. He was far away from his, so he crawled underneath that TD. And a mortar hit right behind it, and it went in and killed him. And then we had a, a terrific barrage, but somebody miscalculated. They must have had one click up on the range, and most of it hit in the back of us. But as he was telling about the weather, the weather was absolutely horrible. It got down to as low as 20 below zero. And, and the funny thing is, you'd think the air would be clear, but we had fog all the time. It'd be clear, and then you'd look up and you'd see a bank of fog coming. It wasn't just coming this way, it was rolling like with the wind behind it, and the Germans then would come in right behind that. And uh, of course they ran out of food that first 10 days because we, we took three days rations with us, but then the wind socked in, they couldn't fly, so we didn't have any food. And the Germans down in Reconia were butchering pigs. We could see them butchering and hanging them up. Nobody shot at them. And a little pig, about 30 pounds, got away and came up toward the line came up to about three or four feet from the woods and started back and Sergeant Debo ran out and grabbed it, held up his arm, shot it with a 45. They laid it down in the snow on its back and cut it up and parceled it out and the guys ate it. Everybody but me. Two reasons I didn't. One, I don't eat raw meat. And the other, at that time, almost every pig in the world, you know, a good possibility had trichinosis, and I wasn't going to go through that. It was miserable enough where I was. Uh, uh, Jim, also while you were there, you said a German patrol came down that road one day, and you guys had real fire yeah. discipline until they walked out right in up front of us. Board. I don't know what what are these guys were coming from. It was about a dozen of them came down the road right straight toward us, and when they got down just about to Reconia, they turned to their left, and there's a parallel road there. And everybody said, oh, we're going to shoot them. And uh, Captain Dowd, well, he, you know, Captain Dowd, he said, no, wait a minute. He said, we're going to give you each one of your targets. Don't shoot until I give the order. And he put me back on the mortar, and I was going to fire first. And they were going to let me fire. And then about the time they figured the mortar shell was going to hit, then each of the guys had a target was going to shoot. Well, I dropped two rounds over there between the first and second scout and they both just went up and down on it and they never moved. Well the other guys didn't. There's one guy then when it was over, one German was crawling, he was crawling back where he come from. And somebody hollered out, shoot him bug, shoot him. And he said, no, let the son of a bitch suffer. So nobody shot him. So that was kind of the way things went. And water, somebody doesn't think about water in combat. They never brought any water in. We never gave it a thought. But we had some scouts out, and they find a pond about a mile away from us, and took rifle butts and broke the, the, the ice on it. They had a jerry can. They took off a tank that had either gasoline or diesel. We don't know which. Didn't wash it out. Just filled it full of water and brought it back. Filled up the canteens. And of course, you got to drink it pretty quick because if you leave it overnight, it all freezes up. And that's the way that kind of stuff went. Now I want to tell you another thing. Five days later, right? And there was no heat in there. No. Freezing uh, cold. Well, uh, yeah, so I and a couple of my buddies after I got my hand dressed. And then I found out when I took the glove off to look at the damage to my hand that I had a bullet in the back of this hand also. But anyway, I got treated it at our 502 aid station uh, inside our own lines. And the next morning I left in a truck with four or five others 
to go into Bastogne, and they all said, well, you're, you know, we're, we're going to be shipped, we'll be shipped out of here to Paris immediately. We didn't realize that Bastogne was surrounded, so we were there for another, that was on the 20, morning of the 22nd, we finally left on the 28th, when the 4th Armored, Patton's 4th Armored Division came in. But they put us up in this long building that had been a, a combination brick and stone rifle range, which was uh, not quite as wide as this building, but uh, twice as long. And it was all, and it had a cement covered roof and so on, but towards, towards the end of it, there was a gap about like that across the whole thing for the fresh air to come in. So it was a very cold place. And uh, we had nothing the first two days, just uh, all the walking wounded and so on, to, to lay down on the dirt. And uh, it was damn cold. But then the uh, C-47s flew in, resupplied <coughs> with parachute, with med medical uh, supplies and ammunition. And they all came in padded. They were, they were padded receptacles around it. So the fellows that went out and they brought the supplies in were good enough to bring a lot of the the padded material into us. So then we <coughs> lined, the foot, they lined the floors with that and we had something under us too. But we had a terrible bombing on uh, uh, Christmas Eve, December 24, 1944, and about a few hundred yards from us that there was a direct hit that maybe some of you read about that uh, I don't know how many uh, uh, <coughs> wounded men and most the famous nurse Belgian nurse were killed. Our, our building received a lot of a lot of stones and, uh, and chunks and terrible, terrible vibrations, and, but nothing could penetrate the thick walls that we were in. But the vibrations were the worst I ever, uh, I ever felt. There were 500 pound bombs. Well, as to that, uh, 20 years after Dick told me about this building, I couldn't find it. For one thing, it's in a fenced enclosure where all the Belgian Army barracks buildings are. They finally started let us go in there a few years ago to see the so-called Nuts Cave where McAuliffe's headquarters were. And I asked one of the Belgian soldiers there, where is uh, you know the uh, indoor rifle range? And so he walked me back about two blocks from where McAuliffe's headquarters was. And there was a strange building, like Dick said. It's really long, but it's uh, an indoor rifle range. It's a complete enclosed building with a roof and it's made out of bricks. It's quite thoroughly constructed. The guys who were in there had no warmth. They were lying on the cold ground and uh, a sergeant from H Company 502 who was wounded on the 20th of December was lying in there also. He gave all his warm clothing away to one of his buddies when he left the line because he figured he was going back to a warm place. But he froze his butt in that place for the next five days till Patton broke through. But the, on Christmas Eve when they bombed there, the concussion from the bombs was so great, the wounded guys that were lying on the ground had hurt their wounds, so they were rolling up onto their forearms and elbows to uh, absorb some of that concussion before it hit their body. Anyways, Dick 